Hello, my name is Dr. Simon Freiler, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. This video will explain peripheral neuropathy. When we look at the nervous system, it has two main components. We have the central nervous system, which refers to the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerve. And we have the peripheral nervous system, which is all the nerves outside of that. When we think about the peripheral nervous system, we can think about it in a number of ways. We can think about it in terms of function. So we have sensory nerves, and they transmit signals of touch, for example, from our hands up to our brain. We have motor fibers, which transmit contraction signals from our brain down to our muscles. So if I wanted to lift my thumb up, for example, I would be activating my APB muscle through the motor nerves. And then we have the autonomic nerves, which look after the things that we take for granted. For example, our gastrointestinal system, how our heart works, sweating, those kind of functions. We can also think of the nerve fibers in size as well. We have the large myelinated fibers, and these fibers are the most important in terms of our daily activities. We have the small myelinated fibers, so these will include rapid pain signals, and small unmyelinated fibers, which transmit slow pain signals. This is a schematic of a typical peripheral nerve. So we have the axon, which is the central wire of the nerve, and this transmits the signal along it. And we have around it a protective myelin sheath. And this sheath makes sure that the speed of conduction is optimal. So if we think about problems with the peripheral nervous system, the most simple one to think about is an axonal neuropathy. And this is where the axon, the central core of the nerve, where the signal is transmitted across it shrinks down as we have here in the upper schema and you can easily appreciate and understand that in such a case there'll be less signal either going up to the brain from the sensory signals or going down to the muscles in terms of the motor fibers now the myelin sheath is really important the way the axon transmits a signal requires currents to be formed across its membrane over here like so and were this to be purely the case this would be a very slow and laborious way of transmitting the signal if you notice here in between the wraps of the myelin sheath there is actually small gaps and these are known as the nodes of Ranvier, and these allow for a much more rapid transmission of the signal in a process called saltatory conductance. And here, the current's jumping across between these different points. By having this kind of structure, the signals are sent very rapidly across the axon in a smooth, rapid, and efficient manner. Now, there are conditions where there's a generalized reduction in the amount of myelin sheath. And in these scenarios, the signals are transmitted in a generally slow manner. A very important example of this is Charcot-Marie Tooth Type 1A, where the hallmark of this condition is a generalized slowing of all the sensory and motor nerve fibers. Much more common than that are focal entrapment neuropathies like carpal tunnel and ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. So for carpal tunnel syndrome, there's a separate video you can link to to explain that. We have entrapment of the median nerve at the carpal tunnel by inflamed flexor tendons and they squash the nerve from the outside and thereby first damaging the myelin sheath and thereafter the axon. Similarly with ulnar neuropathy at the elbow we have a similar process where the ulnar nerve is trapped through the cubital tunnel here. So if we think about a focal demyelinating lesion so we have pressure from the outside and that's pushing on the myelin sheath and reducing the amount of it that's there, the signal slows down at that point of demyelination. If there's further pressure on the myelin sheath, then there's even less myelin there and the axon starts to become denuded of this. If there's yet more pressure still, you can appreciate here that not only has the myelin sheath been damaged, but also the axon itself can become damaged too and causes a blockage of conduction. So these are the hallmarks of demyelination. We have slowing of conduction. This can be a very focal process. It can be multifocal affecting different nerves. It can even affect the same nerve in different places as it travels along. Or we could have generalized slowing of conduction. 
we've alluded to conduction block where signal is stopped from going along the nerve itself and we also have a concept called temporal dispersion where the spread of conduction velocity increases although the actual area remains the same so nerve conduction studies are used to tell us what type of a problem is affecting the nerves is it an axonal problem where the axon is shrinking is it a demyelinating problem where the myelin sheath is reducing in size or is it a mixture of these two it also allows us to know which nerves are affected are these single nerves or multiple nerves or all the nerves it also lets us know what nerve fibers are involved sensory fibers motor fibers autonomic fibers are possible to test but these are actually quite difficult or all of the fibers nerve conduction studies can also tell us about the overall pattern is this a distal length dependent pattern whereby the most distal furthest out nerves which are very small narrow and vulnerable to attack are being attacked by the pathological process is it a more proximal po process which can also give us clues as to what's going on is it generalized are all the nerves being affected is it multifocal or is it a combination of common compression sites or just simple entrapment neuropathies so what kind of clues can neurophysiological investigations provide us as to the type of peripheral neuropathy that is occurring for a patient so Amongst the congenital peripheral neuropathies, let's just take Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. Here we can have predominantly demyelinating disorders, such as within the type 1 group, and we can have predominantly axonal forms in the type 2 group, and we can have mixtures of this as well in some of the other groups of this as well. Within the demyelinating groups, we will find generalized slowing of nerve conduction throughout the peripheral nerves without evidence of conduction block or temporal dispersion because it's a uniform loss of myelination across the nerves amongst the acquired causes of peripheral neuropathies if we look for example at trauma what can neurophysiology tests provide first of all they can tell us exactly where lesions of the nerves are occurring for example patients who have shoulder dislocations sometimes the type of peripheral neuropathy that they can have occurs at the brachial plexus level and we can use neurophysiology tests to delineate where exactly that's occurring within the brachial plexus sometimes it can be individual nerves that have been pranged or stretched and we can use the test to locate those as well we can also see what kind of nerve damage has occurred has it been predominantly to the myelin sheath in which case recovery may be only just a couple of months as that sheath regenerates from those schwann cells or would it be an axonal lesion where the nerve has to regrow and that can take many months or even years inflammatory causes very important ones are Guillain-Barre syndrome or CIDP this is where the nerves become inflamed particularly the nerve sheath as it is attacked by the immune system and there are various different types of these conditions some of which are more demyelinating some of which are more axonal and it's really important to get the treatment right and provided quickly for these patients certain infections have got their own characteristics for example Lyme disease neoplastic processes either directly for example from lung cancers uh, invading into the brachial plexus sometimes it's an indirect peripheral neuropathy which can occur for example paraneoplastic syndromes and the effects of treatments as well particularly the platinum based agents metabolic causes of peripheral neuropathy can also sometimes be identified for example diabetes which is by far the most common cause of peripheral neuropathy certainly in the western world can be identified primarily by having both length dependent effects on the sensory more than the motor nerves together with mild demyelinating features in poorly controlled diabetes the degree of demyelination can become so severe that it can be confused with CIDP certain vascular causes such as vasculitis can manifest themselves within the peripheral nerves as well and we can pick this up as an asymmetric process degenerative causes of peripheral neuropathy are also very important particularly in age-related degeneration where there is a length dependent axonal loss of sensory more than motor nerve fibers i hope this overview has been useful 
and I look forward to seeing you again on my next video.